We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and that was quite a race. Quite a race, quite an experience watching the race. <laughs> If you can't tell, or for those of you who aren't watching on YouTube, I am not at home. I am currently in Birmingham, Alabama, which is I kind used of to live there. My second home. It's Catherine's former home. I'm pulling double duty. I'm on a work trip and podcasting. So, but I know it was crazy race, and we'll get into it. But this is the most stressful racing watching experience I think I've ever experienced. Um, So I was trying to watch in the Houston Hobby Airport while I was traveling and there was like no connection. So I kept like walking in and out of the terminal. Then they had it on at the Buffalo Wild Wings. So I was watching on this really, really small screen. And then someone's like, oh, can we get the game on this TV, even though it's on the seven surrounding TVs? And I'm like, you've got to me. Ugh. And then I finally got hooked up to one of the vendors Wi-Fi because he was like, oh, you're trying to watch F1. I'm like, yeah, I am. And I can't watch it. He's like, oh, here, I'll put you on our Wi-Fi. I'm like, yes, thank you. Nice. But then I walked away and then I lost the Wi-Fi. But I ended up seeing the entire race. Bits and pieces I missed. But the important things I, I saw, like Carlos winning. So that's exciting. Yeah, I'm. <laughs> Based on on how we were DMing, you you got you got like ninety five percent. You got what you needed to see to like I understand some of the what radio happened. calls, which is unfortunate because it seemed like there were really good radio calls this week. But you know, it's yeah, fun. here we are. Carlos won. Yeah, great day for Ferrari. So great I can't day complain. for Ferrari. I can't complain. Yeah. as you sit there wearing, I know you can't see it on camera, but as you sit there wearing your McLaren sweatshirt. <laughs> Yeah, which is just becoming my absolute favorite sweatshirt because it's so comfy and it's like an extra large. So I feel just so warm and fuzzy in my McLaren blanket, I like to call it, not my sweatshirt. But not a great day yeah. for McLaren, but not kind of. not not entirely. Not, not a not mixed a, mixed bag. Not as bad of a day as Checo Perez had. So that is true, and we will we will get there. Um, and to all of Red Bull shooting itself in the foot. But before we do, let's talk <laughs> about the real winner of the Mexico City Grand Prix. Yes, the winner before the winner. The winner before the winner, yeah. Uh, so the the actual uh, winner of the uh, Mexico City Grand Prix is apparently one Sunny Hayes. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to watch uh, how we reacted to the F1 movie trailer because Sunny Hayes is Brad Pitt's character. And yes, they were filming in Mexico this weekend. Which, like, I love this, but at the same time, it's like, what a spoiler. If we already know what races he's winning, like... The whole point of a race is to watch who wins. And if we already know who wins, what's the point of watching? I don't know. Like, that or he's just really excited to be in Mexico City and runs around with the flag and he didn't win, which I think would be super weird and awkward. But yeah, I don't know. Like, I like, like, again, I like that they're filming on actual race weekends. It's really exciting. You get real true fans and the real experience. But I just don't love that we're already going to know what happens in the movie. Because let's be real, there's not going to be enough plot to really carry it. I mean, that's true. No, it, it, so so we know in Mexico, unless they're like trying to like pull one under us and they're they're filming fake stuff, but I don't think they would waste the resources. But everybody was really hyped in, you know, all the fans were really hyped to see him um, and to like try to get themselves into the, the background of footage. And yeah, uh, we haven't really had much of an update about the movie since the trailer came out this summer, but it is still being filmed and will be released um, June 25th, 2025 internationally and June 27th, 2025 in the US. I will probably be at camp, so I'm going to have to coordinate figuring out days off. Hopefully I'm not hiking on that day um, or it's uh, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I still think it's weird that a trailer came out when they still have a lot of filming left to do, but... Yeah, I, I mean the, the trailer as as we as we heavily discussed in our trailer <laughs> breakdown was very very thin. Yeah. So we'll see. There were five there, words uh, and lots of cars going groom fast. A footage that they've just adapted from previous races and wrapped in their car. So it's great. <laughs> yeah, I yeah there there was that. There was a lot of like you know stuff from Silverstone in quote unquote practice and. We'll see. I'm going to assume that they're going to film throughout, you know, the rest of the season, which, of course, is what the next month and a half and 
or, or less, I don't know, time is weird. And we will see next summer what this movie is actually going to look like. Yeah, who knows? All right, well. Anyway. Again, a podcast that only talks about things in the future. Mm-hmm. Let's bring it back to today. Let's talk Carlos Signs. So, holy smokes, is he just like on a roll at Ferrari in general. He looked so right. good today, pulled away. I thought he had such a beautiful, beautiful overtake of Max Verstappen. Yeah. He did not start well. And I was like, oh, well, there it goes. Like, Max is going to end up winning. Obviously, Max didn't win. Um, but when nope. he overtook Max, I was just like, I literally, I think I was standing, like, in the middle of the airport. And I was like, yes! <laughs> and people were staring at me like a psychopath, which is fine, because I am. But this is really good. And I'm really excited. And Catherine and I talked a little bit about this, of, like, that overtake and this race and this whole weekend for Carlos is like the Carlos we know and love. And I love that he's not holding back to like help Charles in the driver's championship. It's like this, he's driving for himself. He's not going to listen to team orders. Like they screwed him. I want him to like go out on a high to Williams next year. I just can't say enough good things about this weekend for Carlos. And I think that th- that's exactly what he's doing. I mean, he's the first Ferrari driver to win in Mexico since Alain Pross did it a hundred years ago Um, and not only that but this is the first time he got to win a formula one race in front of his mom i saw that i saw his mom in the in the garage for ferrari um with his girlfriend and then also of course the 27 other carlos signs carlos (laughs) signs all all of the all of the other carlos including senior and cousin carlos cousin carlos was hyped and definitely if you watch the post-race interviews you saw him uh give carlos carlos gave carlos a hug um in the middle of the interview yeah no we love cousin carlos cousin carlos is he's also a manager or like some agent he's he's his driver manager yeah yeah okay because I knew he did something but he is like his number one fan and I love it I'm so here for it he gets so excited it's really cute to see but yeah big things coming out of the Ferrari garage love it yeah so yeah and it was it it's you know the Mexico track is really interesting because it's a very short track. It's one of the shortest on the calendar, which makes it conducive to, you know, really fast racing. But also it makes it conducive to a lot of traffic and yeah. a lot of getting around lapped cars. Like I, I think almost half of the grid did get lapped by the end of the race, which is, yep. you know, yep. some tracks that's more common than others. But it, you know, traffic can be a mixed bag where traffic can help you maintain your lead or traffic can, you know, help somebody come get you, which is exactly what happened with P2 and P3 with Lando and Charles, because Charles was like sitting pretty in P2 for ever after the Max Lando incident. And right. then all of a sudden Lando was on his back and he was getting DRS from all these back markers and suddenly Lando's overtaking in P2. Well, and Lando really played it well because I swear he was eight, nine seconds behind Charles and then all of a sudden he was overtaking him. And I was like, that yeah. happened way faster than it should have, but it it didn't register all of the, the DRS that he was getting and just, and he kind of played that really well. He stuck around, knew when to get it so it would help him, which all goes into great strategy. I mean, you have to give him credit where credit's due. I'm personally really disappointed in Charles for giving it up and like the when he went off the track and lost it to Lando and then he just really fell behind really sad to see he did come back and get fastest lap which I think this whole fastest lap like going away was so funny so entertaining it's like why are you taking this from us like all at once five people were pitting for fastest lap um yeah I don't know if that's like to prove a point that they shouldn't take it away or what, but it was really entertaining because all of a sudden on all the radios, I just saw like box, box, fastest lap, box, box, fastest lap, box, box, fastest lap. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think Charles fell asleep a little bit behind the wheel because he was really close to Carlos and then he wasn't. And then Lando, I don't know. It's, it's, it was a disappointing showing from Charles. Although he landed on the podium, I still think that he could have and should have done a lot better. 
Yeah, I mean, he he landed on the podium very securely. I mean, he had the, he had enough time to pitch <laughs> for fastest lap, which you know could could very well have gone very badly. Uh, but I also think you know, th- this this day, you know, not not against Charles, but to to go back to Carlos really quick was a little bit of vindication for him because even Martin Brundle was saying on the broadcast, like I really feel like Carlos has been so underrated for you know yeah. for so long, and I'm sitting here like Emily and I have been saying that for like three years now I've been his number one hype man maybe not number one but like very close to the top for Carlos Sainz and I've always said he is a much better driver than Charles Charles just gets favored and when you get favored you get mm-hmm. the better strategy and they're all looking out for you as number one then yeah obviously things are gonna go your way more often than than for Carlos but Carlos always having to like take the back seat take the worst strategy make his own strategy and he's still able to win and do good things in the car. It's so impressive to see. And I, again, going back to JV, James Valls, our leader and, you know, he will do favorite, our favorite. Um, I think he sees that and he knows how talented Carlos is. And I hope he just like exploits that talent and Williams comes back and is like, you know, world champions again a contender yeah yeah i'm saying world champion let's just be in the middle of the pack (laughs) let's just let's just let's just get them out of the bottom first but like he he says such positive things about carlos that you never hear from anyone at ferrari you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so it's just really no but it is vindication for sure i love it yeah it, it, it fully is but and and you you saw the way Charles looked in like the cool down room. I I don't know if you saw it because you might have been trying to board the plane. I was, but I was flying. He 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 looked like th- this was not the race that he wanted, which is fair because he he gave up what really should have been a sure thing at P two. Not to take anything away from the fact that Lando's tires woke up late yeah. in the race, and McLaren has been good with tire management all year. But Lando's they tires have. really woke up in that second stint in like the latter half toward the end of the race to a, a, a degree I don't think anyone really expected. And so that was really impressive out of the you know the McLaren side of that. But yeah, they, Charles should have finished. Th- it should have been Charles P two Lando P three. Yeah, and even if, like, uh, Charles didn't go off track where Lando was able to overtake him, I still think Lando would have caught up to him and overtaken him. Like, just because he Mm -hmm. made that mental error, whatever happened, um, I still think Lando, Lando, end of the day, still would have, you know, passed him, so... Yeah, exactly. So before we dive into the rest of the the impressive performances, let's talk about the constructors update and the driver yes. standings update this because so there, there's important. there's a lot happening here. <laughs> yeah, lots so, of movement. Yeah, so this was a a great day of points for Ferrari, a good day of points for McLaren, and a damage limitation not so great day for Red Bull. And as you predicted, Ferrari was going to leap over Red Bull in the driver's standings for P2, and they're only 29 points back behind McLaren. So really, I I think it's game on. Yeah, we've got, what, three races left? Four. Four races left? Numbers. Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely doable. I think... I do think it's going to be tough, but I think they can go for it and make a really good go for it. I think they lucked out this weekend by both by placing P1 and P3 and Oscar not being able to fight all the way back to where he normally probably would be with such a tough qualifying spot. Like if he would have qualified and like if he would have made it even into Q3, I, I I think, I mean he would have gotten a lot more points for for them this weekend. So Yeah, no, I mean I, I don't think anybody expected Oscar to struggle so much but but trying to get by the Hosses and obviously he he got past Hulkenberg but couldn't get past Magnuson uh and you know ha- but had he been able to get past both of them and had enough time to get to Max then it you know I I think that I think Max would have been able to hold him off but I don't think he would have been easy but I do think that he would have had a better time of it than trying to hold off Lando because lately you know obviously we know that Max trying to hold off Lando is very very difficult so when I made my prediction of Ferrari jumping Red Bull 
I, one, did not anticipate Max to struggle so much. I thought fully it would be because Checo shot the bed, and he really did. And I also thought Charles and Carlos were going to do well. But I also didn't anticipate them gaining so much on McLaren as well. Like, that is something that I was not anticipating at all. I thought for sure McLaren was going to be out in front and just run away with it for the rest of the season. Red Bull only has one driver scoring point. So I knew that they were going to fall back. But this was not how I saw the movement in constructors overall. Like this was now like Ferrari and McLaren are so much closer than I ever would have anticipated. Right, exactly. And I mean, even if Max didn't have 20 seconds worth of penalties, which if you take 20 (laughs) seconds off, uh, yeah, it's very Kevin Magnuson of him. But if you take that off of his time and, you know, running under something, that would have put him in P4 to to finish the race, which would only have given Max four more points. So Red Bull would be 21 points back math. Uh, I think that was correct. But yeah. It, but still, it even, really... like, the McLaren of it all with Oscar, you know? Because, like, I right. would have anticipated Oscar maybe to get, like, P4 or P5, so. Right, exactly. And it, it just – I don't think when when we were getting into this Red Bull-McLaren battle, we really – expected Ferrari to go on this tear that they're on right now and to have I I we I don't think we really considered Ferrari ever being in the mix with this no and like I mean I don't want to compare them to Mc, um not McLaren uh Mercedes of getting sneaky points because this isn't a sneaky point get these are like no not intentional point grabs that they're going after that I again we we've switched our podium projections completely from it being like all McLaren and Max to now considering the Ferraris, which right. I had given up on them and for them to really come I back had is, too. is exciting. So love to see yeah. it. Yeah, and then okay, now we and can then get leading into the drivers. Into- yeah, yeah. Leading into the the we didn't expect this out of Ferrari on the driver side of things. Max is three hundred sixty two points. Lando is forty seven points back with three hundred fifteen, and Charles Leclerc is in third right now with two hundred nine point ninety one points. He is twenty four points back of P two. And similar to us not expecting Ferrari to be in the mix, I also didn't expect Charles to be this close in the mix for. I don't want to say the championship. I know mathematically it's possible. And he's saying like, until it's mathematically impossible, I still believe in it. I'm sorry, Charles. I don't, don't. but I do think that there is a very significant chance, especially with the way that, that Charles is driving right now, that he could get after Lando and he could upset Lando for P2, because I think that Lando is, is trying to get after Max, but Charles is coming, you know, right behind him and Lando can only, you know, defend it it slash attack so much, you know, on track or even in the situation with trying to get points. Right. I think what's going to happen or what at least it seems like is happening is that Max and Lando are going at each other's throats and they're only going to make this so much worse for each other. And Charles and Ferrari are going to be able to really, you know. Take well, I mean, I think I think that they will for the dri- for the constructors championship, but I think that you know, the, ev- any point that Ferrari takes away from Lando is a point basically given unofficially to Max because Wait, it's fine. Like I know Max is going to win. I have no problem with that. That's fine. Yeah. Like there's no like the, uh, it's the mathematical bullshit. Whatever right. is one thing, but. I think because Max and Lando, like Lando is chasing it and wants it so, so bad. I think that's when the mental errors and mistakes are going to happen because he's putting so much pressure on himself that that's when Charles can jump him. Like I, I don't care about the math. Charles, I think if he keeps driving the way that he was driving prior to like the last five laps of the race and, you know, winning, getting P2s, I think, I think he can do it. I think he can jump Lando. I agree, you know, and so they, they've been talking to go back to the mathematical bullshit portion oh, just to, right. to give people the lay of the land. I'm not good at math, but going into Mexico, Lando, in order to keep pace with Max, 
and, you know, be in contention for the championship has to outscore Max by 11.4 points per race, um, a race weekend, because obviously we have two sprint weekends coming up. He only outscored Max by 10 points this weekend. Max got eight, Lando got 18 points, but that's only 10 points. Lando needed 11. There's 47 points between them, four races and two sprints left. I have not yet sat down to do the math on that because I'm waiting for someone else to do it for me. But here's the thing, um, so too, like just logically, right max had to get a 20 second penalty for him to be 10 points behind lando like right that's just not gonna happen every race weekend and every sprint race one one would think right so like unless max decides to start driving like you know i don't know kevin magnuson kevin magnuson (laughs) more frequently yeah i just i don't see I don't see it happening. Also, I know this is skipping ahead a little bit, but I'm so over who's eliminated from the World Drivers Championships. I just want to jump and, like, say sorry to Kevin Magnuson for all the jokes we've been making about him recently because he actually drove really well today. Yeah, he did. Though I will say that other than the three drivers we just talked about, Oscar is the only other driver still in contention. Carlos is officially out, even though he won. But yes, let's talk about Haas because Haas um, had a, a really, point really weekend. good weekend. <laughs> like, yeah. What is this? Not oh only that, God. but Kevin Magnuson was able to hold off Oscar Piastri, which everybody was like, oh, yeah, you know, Oscar will get past the Haases, and then at the end of the race, it's going to be Max nope. versus Oscar. It'll be a whole big thing, drama, drama, drama. And then, no, it wasn't, which, I mean, I think, you know, going into those last, you know, say, let's say 10, 10 12 laps, you know, Oscar really wasn't gaining to the point where it was really like, oh, yeah, you know, Red Bull is, you know, Max is, Max is in trouble, but from a, going back to the constructors championship, Haas is now 10 points up on RB who had a terrible day. Um, Liam Lawson spent more time fighting with Checo than anyone else. And of course, Yuki (laughs) crashed on, you know, turn three of, of the first lap. And Haas is now 40 points behind Aston Martin. So I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying it is currently mathematically possible for Haas to jump past Aston Martin if they continue being as bad and, you know, Fernando keeps, you know, losing his car. Oh my gosh. And, you know, Lance Stroll just shouldn't be driving, but um, also that. I never thought that we would actually be saying these things about Haas considering like how they started the season. But I also want to take a beat because... These are two veteran drivers who I personally feel have never driven in a good car. So for them to Mm, not really know veterans for so many years and continue to find a seat on the grid. I know K Mags doesn't have one going forward, but like it just goes to show how good of drivers you have to be when you have a really shitty car. And he defends so well. Like we've seen it for him to defend so that. Hulk can stay in points. He defended today against Piastri. Like, K-Max doesn't get the credit he deserves because I feel like he just gets the, oh, yeah, (laughs) he hits everybody and drives like a lunatic. Um, Yeah. But he is actually a very good driver. And I, that's the thing that makes me sad about F1 where, like, it differs from F2 where everyone's in the same car. So you, like, truly know who's a skilled driver versus this, like, a lot of it's car how much of it is driver we have this conversation all the time right 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 like the argument of what if you put k mags in like max's car like how good would he really be and he's never had that opportunity to truly show himself as a really good driver why am i sitting here defending k mags for like eight minutes i don't understand but you know what i mean it's a weird kind of day and you did have to you know fly across country ish i crossed like one state it's like a two not even a two hour flight yeah, exactly. I, I have I have done the, the Houston to, to Birmingham before, and it's – let's just say I don't miss doing that. No. But anyway, other impressive – obviously, we already talked about Oscar. Oscar started P17 after losing his lap in, in, Q, uh, in Q1 and finished P8. It was I, – I, I feel like I'm a little generous putting him in who else impressed because I think that he should have – Everyone thinks that he should have finished ahead of P8, but still starting from P17 and getting to the points, I think was, it's good enough for, for to, the, you know, to, to put him into the impressive tier. No, hundred percent. And I think the thing, like if this was any other track, I would argue it, but 
in Mexico with so much traffic because everyone's getting lapped, having to get through all of that traffic, like I'll give him, I'll give him credit. And for he it. did it twice, right? I, he exactly. he did it his first stint, and then he did it again in the second stint. So you know, it it's it it really shows just how good a driver he is, even though. I would say the last couple of weeks, it hasn't been his best performances. Yeah. So, yeah. but now let's okay. talk about who disappointed. Let's do it. This is what I've been waiting for all yeah. day long. Yeah. So let's, let's start with what you really want to w- want to talk about. And then I will circle back to a couple of last second things about Max before we move on. But yeah. Go. Checo sucks. <laughs> <laughs> like, Honestly, I know he had damage, whatever, but like we've seen cars with damage do a lot better than what P17. I think he only passed Joe or whatever. Maybe he didn't even pass Joe at the end. I don't even know where he finished. I just know he no, finished. No, he, no, no, way. he didn't. He didn't. He, he did eventually pass Joe, but then he finished in the back because he, you know, he was one of the ones who was going for fastest lap at the end. <sighs> just picking dumb. Um, yeah, so yeah. he ended up. I mean, it was it was hilarious. P seventeen, yeah. right? P seventeen. Yeah, home race. Great job, Checo. Which yeah. also going back to this whole fastest lap thing. If your car has been going so slow because you have damage, why would you pit to attempt for fastest lap? Logically, because logically. I mean, yes, but the difference in in pace between the medium tire and the soft tire is significant enough that I see what Red Bull was doing. I don't know what the times were on his last lap and, and Charles's last lap, but it wouldn't surprise me if it if it was close. Okay. Well, anyways, also I love this little like rivalry that's happening between Checo and Lawson now because mm-hmm. at this point it's pretty clear Checo is losing his seat next year. And Lawson he said is that going he will be driving it. it next year, but we'll yeah, see. Well, he also I know you says a lot of that things that aren't true. And yeah, no. Lawson is going to drive for Red Bull next year. And Checo knows it. And that's why he hates him so much. And he kept calling him an idiot over the radio. And he and Lawson he, flipped him off. Lawson flipped him off. And I just love that No, they don't like each other. I think it's so great. It's so entertaining. Um, but yeah, so Checo just really had a shitty weekend again. I think that his home race is too much pressure for him. I really do. I just, I don't, and I also just don't think he's a good driver. Like he's not doing yeah, yeah, well. Yeah. So I think when, when he finished on the podium two years ago, it really put too much pressure on him to like continue replicating that. And I mean, you you can say what you want about what happened last year and whether he should have gone for that move in, in you know in that opening portion of the race to try to make it to the front or not or whatever. But yeah, this I, this this whole weekend, this whole season, like he you know he hasn't had the pace. It's it's just been bad. And then yeah, you you can't get into a fight with your junior team to the point where you damage your car and you can't fight back through the field again. Like, you can't do that when you're driving in a Like, that's just not smart racing. And it's not, like... Because, again, the Red Bull's a very, very fast car. If you start and qualify terribly, you can move your way up. Look what Oscar Piastri did. There's no reason Checo should have gotten into that squabble and gotten damage and not tried to actually move himself up. I just, I just, I think he wasn't thinking. That's what I think. Well, yeah, ex- exactly. So it it was not a great weekend for Checo. It was very publicly not a great weekend for Checo. It was just one. It, w- it was like five Perez senior frowny faces because um, yeah. they they did cut to to um, Antonio Perez in the garage and he was not looking happy. Obviously, the 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 grandkids were not there to distract him from his his son's performance, and then we never saw him again. But I just want to least... say something really funny. Okay. We can cut this if we need to. Yes. That's why you're so, around. So so um editing Catherine here for a moment, you just missed Emily making an accurate but very mean joke about uh Max and Yos for Stappen that I am not including in the edit, but let it be known it was funny. And <sighs> speaking really quickly about Max, A, Red Bull really shot itself in the foot 
with the entire weekend and the performances and whether or not Max should have given that place back to Lando really doesn't matter when Max just needs to clean up the fighting against Lando or stop qualifying near Lando so they're not racing near each other. And another thing that I wanted to point out is uh, Max had to replace his engine over the weekend. Obviously his Friday sessions were absolutely terrible and not helped by the Pirelli tire test, but they changed his his power unit to one that were um that was words Catherine that was in his usable allocation it was one of his older older engines he implied that he's probably going to have to take another engine penalty this you know in toward the tail end of the season I think logically Brazil is the best place for him to do it because a there's a sprint race and the penalty will not affect the sprint race it'll rep- um It'll affect the Grand Prix, which is exactly what Lawson did um, last week at Cota, yep. and it. And I think it's it's a track where it's not easy to move through the field. But I think if you have a fresh engine in the back of your car, it it's. I think it's the the most likely place that you should. Um, I wouldn't want to try it in Vegas. I also wouldn't want to try it during the Sprint Weekend in Qatar. Um, and obviously, you're not going to do it in Abu Dhabi. So if we're thinking about the most logical times for Max to take that engine penalty, it would be next week. Logically, yes, unless they really think that this engine can carry them through and they're going to try and go without taking another engine. Because, like, I know, I it's just, it's a, it's all a game of what ifs, so you never know. Yeah, but I, I think if, Cause like, what if I think Max is going to, and then you need another one, you know what I mean? That's always the ri- the risk that you run, but at the same time, I think that if you want to, if if you want to get it out of the way as quickly as possible, so you have that fresh engine in for your last four race weekends, you might as well do it, you know, right here, right Agreed. now. Agreed. Yeah. So we'll, so we'll see how that goes. We'll see. See if he's you know starting in Argentina for the Brazil Grand Prix. Um, one thing <laughs> yes, I want to exactly. talk about before we jump to our predictions, which we just shot the bed this week. Um, oh, yeah. so I personally was really sad to see Fernando have such a bad weekend on his right? you know, 400th F1 weekend. I was very excited for him. He, it wasn't too bad at the beginning of the race. And then all of a sudden he was pitting and, and everyone was like, what's going on? And it, he had to And then he the missed the pit box marks. I know. And, I saw all, that. and everybody was like, what was, what, <laughs> why, <laughs> what did he forget where his marks were? Yeah, it was, it was very unfortunate. I think either a tear off or some debris got into a, like a duct or something. Cause they were talking about overheating issues. Right. I don't think that they, they mentioned exactly what had happened, but it was probably something. Um, for, I, I would assume it was something from that, um, Yuki Albon incident at the start of the race. Right. Yeah. So it's crazy how those tear offs can really cause damage. Like that's what made Max's car c- catch fire in Australia. Yes, exactly. That's what happened. One but... stinking tear off. But fortunately for Fernando, he will have the chance to celebrate his 400th race start in Qatar. Maybe. So the celebrations still, are not over yet. This could still go wrong, Catherine. <laughs> I mean, yes, there's a chance that he doesn't he doesn't get the race starts, but he he was talking in the um in the pre-race interviews of like, "Oh yeah, I can't wait to get to to 450." And I'm like, "Oh man, this 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 man will drive as long as Daddy Stroll lets him." And it's great. It is. It is. So, all right. Well, with that, let's get into our Mexico predictions, even though it's a mute point <laughs> because we did terrible. So we can run through these quickly. Paul, I was on the right track with this saying Charles because of the Ferrari, but it was Carlos. You had Lando, I had Charles. We both yep. lost there. Podium was Carlos, Lando, Charles. Uh, you had Charles, Max, Lando. I had Max, Charles, Lando. So we both really Oops. missed the boat on there. We both had uh, Franco, Colopinto, for P10, it ended up being Gasly. Again, I forget that Gasly is even a driver, like, half the time. But It's so, it's so irrelevant. So. Um, and then Franco, Franco, was, it, he had, like, a great first half of the race. And then the second half, he just, um, he had a little bit of a collision with, um, with Lawson and just, you know, didn't, didn't really have the, the, the best pace. And I think there was a little bit of pressure on him for being the only Williams, Williams driver still yeah. on the grid. 
but but also let's talk about the return of the uh yellow engine cover on their livery for for this weekend and for next weekend i think that was that was fun it was a nice little throwback to the old days but yeah this was I not love a great the weekend battery, for williams though. I do just love the that Duracell is battery. True. It's so good. No, it yeah. wasn't a great showing. But again, I think he's really showing promise as a young driver. He's had, what, mm-hmm. three race weekends now? Four? I think it's like four. Yeah, it's he's he has not been on the clean, grid very long. Four clean race weekends in a row, which I think is longer and a better streak than Sargent ever had. So I think it was a really good decision, a great switch. Um, and it, and he's a promising young driver. And I will yeah, push and, for and him to get a seat somewhere. <laughs> and it's not like he's expected to score points. I mean, obviously, he's expected to score points every week. But, you know, it, it's this wasn't a bad weekend for him. It was just unfortunate and a little tough because he was running towards the tail end of the points for a good portion of the race. Yeah. And it is, I mean, he, it, like you said, very promising rookie. He will do great things in formula one when he gets back, whenever that is 26, yep. 27. So, all right. But yeah, Gasly, whatever. <laughs> right. Gasly. Okay. But we did do pretty well on our biggest surprise and who's going to do a dumb, we which did. we don't give ourselves points for just because these are more fun to do. Um, but you said that Checo going to make it to the end of the race because he didn't last he year. Did. He did. He did make it to the end of the race in last place, yep. but he still finished. And I said that Ferrari was going to jump Red Bull in the constructors, and they did, which is super exciting. Yep. We talked about that earlier. And then for who's going to do a dumb, you said that Alpine is going to be back in the shits. I would say yes. Um, I would say, yeah, the, I, for, I forgot to write the, the whole thing, but it was they would be back to in, in the in the toilet now that they don't look like a McLaren anymore, which I think that they they had the performance of a typical Alpine that looks like an Alpine, not an Alpine that looks like a McLaren. Yes, agreed. Um, and then, you know, the uh, to just pick the obvious one, I said that Checo was going to bomb his home race again, and he did. And he did. Again. So, yeah. Yeah. Final thoughts. I personally thought this race took a million years and maybe it's because we had the safety car in the beginning for so many laps, but honestly, it felt like it took forever. Not that that's a bad thing. I just kept looking down and I was like, oh my gosh, we're not even like a fourth of the way through. Oh my gosh, we're still not halfway through. It just seemed like it dragged on, which I don't, again, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just, it felt like a very long race. Yeah, it it definitely felt like it took forever. A lot of things happened. I think that, you know, the the say what you will about the Max Lando drama of it all and, you know, whether Max is a dirty driver or just, you know, that's a McLaren talking point. But I think that Max is obviously feeling the pressure to maintain his position and just needs to to understand that all he needs to do is make sure that he is keeping pace with Lando. There was mm-hmm. definitely a lot of damage limitation to, to his drive. And I think that there's credit to Max for the fact that he had a 20 four second pit stop to serve those two penalties and still managed to finish within 10 points of Lando. And you can talk, you know, until the cows come home about like how many seconds behind Lando, how many seconds behind the race leader, but, and obviously there got to a point where Max's tires just stopped performing and he stopped gaining on Lewis. And also, can we talk about the fact that it took Lewis forever to overtake George with damage and that's all we saw for like 20 minutes of the broadcast was Lewis trying to get George and failing miserably. And on, George, on every as I said, it's... had damage. Oh, it was so bad. And Lewis yeah. has the better car. Lewis has the upgrades. George is driving such an old spec car <sighs> because he's damaged his car so much. And like they've hit their limit of what they can do. So he's driving such an old spec car. And I just, it's... Yeah. I honestly also, think Lewis George- is just kind of over it and sunsetting his time with Mercedes. Yeah, he's just ready to go over to Ferrari. But I, I, also speaking of Mercedes, they did say that thanks to George's, you know, most recent crashes, which also George has been in some nasty crashes these last couple of weeks, G-force wise, but they are bumping up towards the edge of the cost cap. Yeah. So that's uh, kind of a problem. This is also something that I want to talk about. I don't know how it is in F1. I know that if you get in an 
accident with more than like 20 G's, you're, you have a mandatory medical like checkup, whatever. But like, Mm -hmm. what is concussion protocol on these drivers? Like officially, because there's no way George doesn't have a concussion after his crash was like 35 G's. Like there's just no way he has a concussion. I mean, should he be driving? (laughs) I would like to argue no, and not because he's not my favorite person, but, like, just safety of him and everyone around him. That seems so dangerous, and I don't care how much you train to, like, take Gs. You can't train your body to crash at 35 Gs. You're definitely not wrong. Obviously, Formula One has some of the best, you know, protective measures and safety measures in any sport i think honestly the right. um nfl should, should take yeah. note but not only do you have like the helmets that basically crush your your brain in in to keep it in place in the helmet but they also have the hands device which is that thing that is um that connects to it that looks like a little like weird cage thing on the back of their neck that stops that it, it hooks onto the the back of their helmets and basically stops your head from moving. Now we've seen on boards with drivers, Lance Stroll had a nasty crash and his head was going in like 14 right. different directions. And he had a concussion from that. We didn't see what, what had happened, you know, with George's, but not only do they have that, but they have like the shoulder protectant that you see them lift that big wedge thing off when they're coming out of the cars. So they have a lot of protective measures, but also still when you're sustaining, G's. <laughs> yeah, when you're sustaining a 25 G crash and I, I like a 30 G crash, I think that's th- what the G forces were on, on Georgia's last two crashes, which have been in each of the last two weeks, something is turning your, your brain into liquid in there. So it's, it's very interesting that, you know, I want to, I want to know more about Georgia's brain. Yeah. It also, like, I will give him credit, though, because it takes a lot to get back in the car after that happens. Like, I mean, everyone processes trauma differently, but for all of these F1 drivers to go through some of these crazy crashes and then be like, oh, yeah, tomorrow I'm getting in the car again. Like, I do give him a lot of credit for that because I would be like, I'm going to get I'm going to take a beat. Like, Please say I have a concussion. I need I need a, a few days to get over this. But yeah, I mean you're you're not wrong. I think that Formula One drivers, you know, as these performance athletes are also freaks of nature. Like if look at Roman Grosjean. Like he crashed his car. It caught fire. It exploded. It you know it ended up in two, away, two massive pieces. And yes, he walked away from Formula One. But then the next year, he just gets right into IndyCar. And IndyCar is a little bit slower than Formula One. So you're not pulling the same amount of Gs. But it's still fast. And it's yeah. still, you know, big old crashes. And he's like, yep, I'm just going to I'm gonna keep going. And he was actually in Mexico this weekend watching the race. So he, he's, he's still, he still pops up from time to time. Oh, boy. Okay, well, we have reached the end of the podcast. But before we leave... I want to get into my off-track moment. So it's kind of a culmination of moments off-track this weekend. I just really thought it was cool how everyone dove headfirst into, like, the Mexican culture and, like, Dia de los Muertos and all of that going on because it is around that time. And the art on the helmets and, you know, all of the mariachi. Ferrari had a big mariachi, like, band playing at a dinner and Carlos was singing and everyone was singing and that was all over Instagram. And then also you could not have missed Charles showing up to the track in Marriott in a full mariachi with some other people. Um, Yeah, it it was great. Loved it. So that was, an interesting thing to see, but um, I also just love that they all just really... And I feel like, you know, with the mariachi theme song that comes on for F1 when we're in Mexico City... Which, which I want to point out, I was <laughs> very concerned when they did not play it at the very beginning because usually they play it during, during like, the, driver's the, the thing. opener. And I, tec- I, 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 te- I DM'd you and I was like, no mariachi in all caps. And you're like, I can't, I don't have service right now. I was about <laughs> like, to be really no mad. 
I was about to be really mad, but then they played it during the grid lineup. And I was like, okay, good. They did play it because yeah. I would have been really mad if they didn't. Because like we said in the predictions episode, like that's our favorite part of being in Mexico is the mariachi right. version of the F1 song. Yeah. But no, I just, I love how for this race, they do so much around the culture. And like, I know in the U.S., I guess they do, but we don't see it maybe as much just because it's like our maybe day to day. I don't like scream eagles and stars and stripes, but we're right. used to it. So, like, I just, I love that. And it kind of makes me want them to really dive into the culture of all of the other locations as well. Right. You know what I mean? And, you know, yeah, I, I, I fully agree. And I think some of it might have to do with, like, obviously, you know, Mexican culture, Mexican driver. Like, what, you know, would they be, all, you know, would they go as hard if we didn't have a Mexican driver on the grid? Is, is yeah. you know, that's that's one of the things that I Checo's think. Checo's basically not do- on the grid. Let's be real. I mean, let's be real, but he's a, he's a good marketing draw. And um, the guy who sponsors his career was actually the guy who handed out the first place trophy on the podium. Yep. But anyway, I, I want to add an honorable mention to your off-track moment that I just remembered. But watching the Sky Sports pre-show, they did this really great interview package. I don't know if you saw it, but they did a really great interview with Lewis Hamilton's younger brother, Nick Hamilton, who's oh, a disabled motorsport cool, cool, cool. driver. Yeah, so they ha- they had this really great bit, you know, talking about he was born with c- cerebral palsy and, you know, go- you know, going through his-, his childhood being, you know, obviously the younger younger brother of the greatest motorsport star on the planet, you know, Nicholas Hamilton's own career in motorsport and I thought it was a really great little bit. Apparently there's like a 30-minute full segment interview that's available on like the Sky Sports channels and on on YouTube that I'm going to watch at some point, but I just wanted to point out that it was a really cool interview. Um, and, you know, obviously Lewis Hamilton is the, the one of the greatest motorsport stars of the modern era, but there's also another Hamilton who's doing some really great things for both advocacy of drivers of color and also um, drivers who are disabled. Um, it's also doing really cool, cool things. So I think you should also check that out if you have the time. Just find it on the YouTube. I could be lying, but I'm fairly positive that like Monster did a whole like documentary on um Nicholas Hamilton I'm like fairly positive about it because Lewis has really like in- pushed for his and helped him with his career finding like engineers to really help him be able to drive and I think they did it on like the relationship of like with Lewis and Nicholas but like also just really focusing on like Nick and first Lewis so yeah yeah I think exactly. I, I, so I was... feel like it was done by Monster but I could be wrong because Monster could, used it, to be it, a sponsor <laughs> But it guy. could have been, yeah. The, the way that they were able to, you know, adapt a car for a disabled driver to drive was really cool. And he was talking about how, like, you know, all, there's all this footage of, like, him in the stand celebrating Lewis. And then there was one race last year where he scored and everybody was celebrating him. And it was really cool that, like, he was the one being celebrated and got to punch the air. And, you know, his dad was there. His brother was there. So, yeah, really cool, he, you know. Obviously, Lewis Hamilton is not my favorite driver, but I understand what he does for the sport, along with everything else in the the Hamilton family. So go forth and watch that. Once again, Catherine has to say nice things about Lewis Hamilton. Check Um, that off, your bingo cards. (laughs) Okay, so coming up next, we we are just going for it once again. So back to back to back. We are in Brazil. It's another sprint weekend, but we do like the Brazil sprint. So we aren't, won't sit here and complain about it too much, but that will be much. out <laughs> still a little bit, but not too much, but that prediction episode will be out. I think Thursday. We'll see. TBD. Yeah. We're, we're recording on Thursday. So it'll be out whenever I'm done editing it. So it'll be out late Thursday night. So it'll be first thing that you see on Friday morning because that is how time works. So get ready for that. And yeah. Get ready because Emily's traveling for her real job, even though this I would love for this to be my own real Can you imagine if all we had to do is sit and, and talk about like F1 for our, like our real lives? But just yeah, be like, that'd be fun. Okay, anyways, we'll get there. Not to go off track, but this has been our Mexico City Grand Prix recap episode. Thanks for going off track with us, guys. <laughs>